Um, hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us tonight at Venture Cafe. As Natalie mentioned, I'm Angela McQuillan. I'm the curator of the Esther Klein Gallery. And just so you know the relation, the Esther Klein Gallery is part of the Science Center, which is also home to Venture Cafe. So I'm really excited to be speaking with Kristen Neville Taylor tonight and I'm taking a look inside her studio. I've known Kristen for about 10 years or so and we've worked together on various projects and I've really gotten to see her work evolve in some really interesting ways over the years. Um, I first met Kristen when I joined the Philadelphia-based artist collective Little Berlin, which she co-founded in um, 2007 with Martha Savory. Um, she then went on to curate an exhibition at Esther, Esther Klein Gallery much later called The Usable Earth. Um, Kristen's diverse practice combines drawing, sculpture, and glass, which converge playfully in an installation style environment. Her work considers nature, futures, and histories through science, anthropology, science fiction, and mythology. Um, Kristen's work has been shown at Little Berlin Bunker Hull and the Philadelphia Art Alliance in Philadelphia, PNCA, Richard Stockton, and Rowan University Art Galleries in New Jersey, and Expo Chicago. She's organized several exhibitions, including Landscape Techni at Little Berlin, The Usable Earth at EKG, and she co-curated Middle of Nowhere in the Pine Barrens. Taylor is the recipient of the Lori Wagman Prize in Glass, the Jack Malice Scholarship, and the 2017 Vermont Studio Center Fellowship. So now I'd like to go ahead and welcome Kristen Neville Taylor. Hey, Kristen. Hey, Angela. How are you? Good, I'm good. Um, Thanks for coming to my studio. Uh, <laughs> I actually haven't been here too often um, through the pandemic, so um, it was kind of nice to come and unearth some things and dust some things off um, to maybe share it with you all. Um, Definitely. Yeah. Um, so um, would it be a good time to maybe share some images to yeah, I mean, I think it's always good just to like kind of share your work um, in photograph form before we take a look around your studio. Yeah, I think it's good too, because I think the challenge for me always with the studio visit is that um, my work uh, functions best maybe in its like own environment. And um, I always struggle with how to best show that in the studio. The studio for me, I, I don't really like to perform in the studio. So I know that's what's probably best to do when you're um, having guests. Um, but um, anyway, I'll do my, I think it'll be good to show some images now and then maybe show some of the process and some of the individual objects that I have kind of kicking around. Yeah, um, I think so that would be great. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'll just go ahead and share my screen with you. Uh, let me do What's this one. Um, are you seeing the images? Yeah, looks good. Okay, great. Um, so the first image that I'm showing, um, you know, as Angela said, a lot of my work um, and even the curatorial things I've done is um, all stems just, I guess, the the, the overused word nature um, and just understanding the forces and sometimes events that um, influence how we define it or understand it as humans. Um, and so um, the first image I'm showing you is from a show I had at Fleischer Art Memorial in South Philadelphia where I uh, revisited Mary Shelley's Frankenstein uh, through an environmental lens. Um, and this image uh, depicts how I split the gallery in two halves um, one side I created um, uh, was dark with uh, all glass that, glue, that glows in the dark uh, to represent a kind of fantasy of nature. And the other side was more sterile, um, uh, silver foil, clear glass um, to, rep to sort of um, think about uh, the future, um, to model itself after a kind of laboratory. Um, and so I'll be able to show you some of those pieces tonight. How do you have the glass glow in the dark? It is it has like a phosphorescence uh, that um, is um, can up to withstand high temperatures, so it can be molded like at like you know fifteen hundred to you know eighteen hundred degrees, mm -hmm. um, and um, so it can withstand heat. And then it's uh, UV reactive, so under a UV light or in some cases. 
the material I was working with at first was really amazing because it was just sunlight. So it could like charge up and it had the potential to be just kind of self-sufficient. And then they stopped making it in the middle of the project. And so I ended up using a kind that um, as long as like kind of like a black light poster, as long as the black light was on it, it would glow in the dark. So oh, wow. It's pretty um, cool. Margarita wants to know what year was this exhibit? <sighs> Today, 2020. Um, this was 2018. And was this a wind challenge show? This was a wind challenge show. So there's okay. two other um, two other artists. Cool. Yeah. Um, and so this is one of the pieces um, in the dark room uh, that I called uh, Portal. Um, and so um, for me, it represented this, this passage between the world that Victor Frankenstein um, knew um, um, before and then the new world that he called into being when he created the creature. Um, so it also resembles a wedding arbor to reflect like our complicated relationships with nature um, and the ways in which we perpetuate uh, a fantasy of it um, through stories. And these are all hand sculpted glass flowers? Yeah, so they're all, so all of the flowers were made through a mold making process. Um, and so I use, um, I would purchase a glass powder that already has the phosphorescence in it. Um, I would actually take a mold directly from the daisies and then um, use a pat process called pat de verre, which is translates to uh, glass paste in French, and where you mix it with a binder, fill it in the mold in reverse and fire it. So I would do a casting process for the leaves and daisies, and then all of the stems and grasses were made um, in a hot blowing studio where I'm pulling the molten material directly from a furnace and then um, adding the um, glass, the glowing powder um, while it's hot. Um, and then I would glue them together. So it was like, and using almost like, um, I would sometimes have to like facet on a lathe where the leaf of a <laughs> piece of grass would meet um, the grass, sorry. <laughs> um, so it was, um, in some ways really simple. And then the assemblage part was like, I'm more of like a fabricator than like a glass sculptor. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It's really beautiful. Thank you. Um, this was another show, this was from 2017. This was at Vox Populi. And a lot of this work was conceived while I was um, an artist in resident, residence at um, Rare. So, if you know, probably a lot of you have, from Philadelphia have heard of the residency at the recycling center. Um, and so all of the materials were sourced there. Um, and I called the show um, Signals Catch and Release after the fishing term for um, capturing and then releasing things back, the fish back to the water. But in this case, I was thinking about um, the objects that I was collecting that would be just released back into the recycling center when they were finished. Um, um, this is one of the pieces up close. This is called uh, After Nature. Um, I was really interested in, when I was at Rare, I didn't realize how much water played a role in the recycling process. There's so much dust that the water has to constantly be sprayed to keep the dust down. Um, and it collects in this kind of like filthy mess in the corner um, where it drains out into the river. And um, I was really interested in trying to filter some of that water. And then became, then it went down this other road of understanding like different um, filtration systems. Um, and at the time there had been this new research being done by at MIT um, of using um, like cedar branches um, or a modeling after the structure of it. Um, the xylem, it's called a xylem shaped filter um, to filter the water. Um, and so I call this piece after nature. It's meant to have like a pragmatic function. So to show how simple materials can create access to clean water, but also a metaphorical function. The branch is um, modeled after a divining rod, which is um, supposed to help you find water, fresh water on land. And so the, it would, the water would actually filter through the branches. Um, so I don't have the video here. Um, so it actually worked? Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, this is uh, another piece. So one, the reason that I ended up going to, well, my proposal was to use their shredder 
to make, I have this series and I can show you some of these balls that I make with um, found objects, but I wanted to scale that up. So I was able to use their shredder every week, um, which was really amazing to be able to put objects through this giant pulverizing machine. Um, but this was a piece that I made um, that was a little bit uh, different from how I was using the material. Um, and I called it hubris. And this was a corporate office desk that we put through with all of the files and pens and papers, um, and then um, piled it back up. Um, and so I actually found the stereo and the PSA speakers in there and um, used the solar panel in the window to power it to play um, this music that we don't have Kate well, Actually, we have cable now, but for a long time we didn't, and we would watch um, the Weather Channel, and I really loved the music, and so I took that music and tuned it to 528 hertz, which is um, a frequency that, that this man named John Hutchinson, who's kind of like a pseudoscientist, claims to have cleaned the water after the BP oil spill with. Um, so I was using, tuned it to that frequency, and that was the soundtrack for the exhibition. And then inside, there's all these found like ma materials that you might find in a natural history museum that I found in the trash, like a big piece of coral and a, a pheasant and some other fossils and objects. For some reason, I found like three microscopes all these natural like a collection of bee honeybees all labeled meticulously from different people throwing things out um, and i don't know that you would ex you could expect to go to rare and then find all these scientific materials but that's just what ended up happening for me so i'm kind of there. interested in how many materials go through there like it's not just a place for people to send their recycling it it's a you know what how do they determine what ends up there I think if you're a paying customer and you have um, at least, I don't remember, I don't know if anyone's on here from Rare, uh, maybe it's like a ton. I think you have to have a minimum amount um, and you can go there. If you're, if you're clearing out your house, you can go dump there as long as you have the um, minimum load amount and can pay that fee. Um, and so it's a lot of construction debris and um, the house cleanouts, which were the most fun for, I, for me. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Look through all this. I mean, there's of course there's stories in in you know um, construction sites, um, um, and maybe those are as interesting. But there was like more personable stories in the like the estate sales and or the estates and things like that were getting cleaned out. Yeah, definitely. I do have a little video of the shredder. I don't know if that's. Um, it's always just fun to show. I like to show it to the kids, but everybody likes. <laughs> Oh my God, that's scary. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty amazing. It was always um, a lot more material than I could ever anticipate. So I was making these balls and I can show you some of the smaller ones, but um, yeah. And so um, more recently, my, um, my most recent project was more collaborative in nature. Um, with my friend Ricky Giannis, we organized um, a project called the Green Sun, where we looked at um, solar power um, for its like technical and narrative um, possibilities. Um, and this image is from the symposium that we held. Um, and during this uh, period, we were having, um, and we were learning about how the energy grid functions. Um, so it was like a, it was like a participatory um, thing. Um, and so the show title for the um, exhibition, The Green Sun, comes from a quote by Tolkien that asks, what does it take for us to build a world that's believable outside of our own? Um, and that's just like a summary of that. Um, um, and so this was a, we, we um, I can't speak for Ricky, but I, I know that um, maybe I could say that we both see the artwork often as the background to what we're doing, to the larger questions that we wanna share with, um, with people. And so we were able to use the gallery space um, to bring people in, um, have conversations um, around solar energy and the power of imagination. Um, and then I was able to make a piece for that show. So one of the, feels like a million years ago, but one of the last things that I finished was this piece um, that I called uh, 
they told us earth was mother, but it is in fact the sun. Um, and so I was thinking about the role of time in human lives and how capitalism, capitalism uh, challenges environmental progress. Mm -hmm. um, I was um, pregnant when I started it and had a baby when I um, had finished it. And um, I was um, really fascinated with this idea of um, horticultural time or how babies respond differently than, than we do um, to the clock. Um, and so I was looking at um, that period just before the invention of mechanical time. And there was this device made by Athanasius Kircher where he uses sunflowers in water that, and they would turn like using heliotropic, like whatever the right. sunflowers turn according to the um, time of day um, to, to record the time. Um, so that was like his invention was my um, visual reference. Um, and for me, the title also references this tendency to call Earth Mother, like as if um, your mom's going to come clean up after your mess. <laughs> so was, I like to think about the sun as um, mother, um, as life giving, but also punishing. Um, I like that. It's a really beautiful piece. Thank you. I, ha I have it here in less um, pristine form. Um, this is the image. So this was, um, this is a rendering of his invention, which I was referencing. So in place of numerical system, I was using symbols and drawings, uh, references to my own drawings, um, thinking about how we record things according to sites and places and memories and not um, according to linear time. Mm -hmm. um, and to make these, I use like a tiny torch that's powered by uh, propane and oxygen. And I don't do that at my studio. I do have a small torch, but I've never set it up. I'm privileged to teach at Tyler School of Art where I have access to equipment. So I often work there. It's a beautiful studio um, maintained very well by my um, fellow <laughs> staff. <laughs> um, I have a quick question for Margarita. Yeah. I forget the name of the person who you said invented the sunflower clock, but when did he live and invent this? Do you know? Um, I, I, was, I was thinking I should like know that by heart, um, but I believe it was the 17th century, but I'll double check that for you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So basically I use a lot of, um, resource heavy materials like glass and gas and oxygen and recently as like a new parent and as an artist that's like um, heavily reliant on materials I've been like questioning that and this was something that I did too just um, before quarantine um, as I'd been thinking about um, maybe shifting my practice and so um, I was just compelled to do this and I wasn't sure that I would call it a piece but it's a it's a thing that I made um, and I did it at a place that when I was in high school, we used to go a lot to kind of try to step outside of like the structure of our lives. And it felt like a good place to do that and ask this question, kind of put it out there in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of where I'm at. And it seemed like um, the perfect thing to kind of um, do uh, pre-quarantine um, as like I've not really had a lot of access to time to to make um and i'm just kind of in this space of like allowing myself to be changed by this rather than feeling like um frustrated from limited uh studio time or something like that so that's my last image and so i guess now i could um answer questions and also just start to take a look around definitely um so how did you get started working in glass first of all um, I was really young. I was um, in high school. My, I was like really curious about it, but no one knew anything. And um, I'm just gonna I have some like glow in the dark stuff down here. I'm just gonna. Can you actually stop sharing your screen because so oh, yeah. you can see you on the on the big screen? Right. Awesome. Hi. <laughs> hey. Um, yeah, my high school oh, wow. art teacher would let me like. Um, put things in the kiln, but nothing ever worked because none of us, we, neither of us knew what we were doing. Um, so that's kind of where it started. Um, and then um, I met Martha Savory mm -hmm. and she was, we were taking a draw, work, workshop in high school at Moore College of Art. 
and she was blowing glass at this public studio and she was like you should come do it and I started interning there and then I just was like I just want to do this and, and that's why I went to school at Temple because it was like a pretty affordable school with glass blowing. Yeah definitely. I love these pieces right here. Yeah these were in that show in in the same room with the um um the uh, archway and so it just it's not probably that easy to see. It is and I'm actually really interested in the clock. How how does that work? That's all glass. Yeah, um, so I used um, path of air um, on the surface, except for where the, um, let me see. <laughs> I used path of air everywhere except for like the screen. I wanted it to be more clear here, but mm -hmm. I should have polished it probably. So it was like lazy glass, glass artist over here. Um, but um, it looks great. Yeah, it works pretty good. Um, yeah, and I called these all like souvenirs of a marriage and they all had like different symbolism. Um, and then this is my, I have the, the mold for the lion here. So I'll use, I use a last lost wax casting process. So I make a rubber mold. This was the original. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'll make a mold of um, this. I made a mold of this object and then I have the mold and I pulled the wax out of there. So is that just like a found object? Yeah, it's just a found object. Cool. In Frankenstein, there's this famous scene and that's a, that was like my visual reference for the portal where um, the creature, the first friend that the creature makes um, is a young girl and she has a kitten and they play this game where they throw daisies in the water together on Lake Geneva. And um, she's the only one that doesn't cringe. And then he mistakenly um, thinks that he, he throws her in, she'll float and she oh, drowns no. um, <laughs> and she dies. <laughs> Brutal scene. <laughs> um, but um, so the lion for me is kind of like this, um, this way that we will um, either domesticate or wild our nature to like suit a story and mm -hmm. so I have like the kitten in the portal and then the the lion on the mantle the other objects I love that yeah so does, my anyone, does anyone have any questions for Kristen real quick All right, that's, what is the butterfly? That's really pretty. It's just like almost like a caricature. It's like a glass butterfly also. So it's not really glowing as well um, up here. Oh, wow. But yeah. Yeah. So I feel like your work has a really interesting way of blending like legitimate scientific themes with kind of like pseudoscience in a way almost. Yeah. Um, and like some examples of that I'm referring to like um, is the divining rod piece mm -hmm. also reference the farmer's almanac. Um, yeah. So what does this like combination of fact and sort of like myth mean to you? Um, I mean, I think, um, I think it has a lot to do with, um, I mean, I remember like some of the first work that I was making as like a college student, I was thinking about like, oh my God, the scientist has his, or they have their own motivation, you know, like they're a person and, and they're funded. And it was like this revelation for me that um, like, actually I have this really ugly thing that I made still. It's, it's called <laughs> scientist in context. And um it's a skull <laughs> that I made and it's glass. It's in this bell jar and then it has a puppet string. So it was like, who is the sci like how, what are the motivations for the science? And then each drill, it's like totally Mütter Museum, Meredith. Is <laughs> <laughs> totally inspired by the Mütter Museum. Like each hole that was drilled is according to like a different section of the brain and like, you know, what would have influenced the scientists. That's always been interesting to me is that there's always more to the story than the scientific evidence that's presented definitely it's like a history there's um yeah there's an um 
maybe like a shadow company funding it um, money board yeah, of trustees exactly. like who are they yeah so um that's always been that kind of blew my mind when I started to put that stuff together mm -hmm. and so it's never really gone away it's always been trying to um negotiate the facts with the fiction yeah definitely yeah um so what got you interested in work that focuses on environmental issues um, I mean, that's a good question. I think I have like always been curious about the way that stories were shaping um, our ideas of nature. And like one early show that I did was called Landscape Techni. And it was about like technology's influence on the way that artists were portraying landscape. Um, and I think at the, t I think um, looking back now I see like the environmental, um, role in that show even though it wasn't clear to me at the time like I think it it was just that I was reading these like science magazines and you're just you or the newspaper and you just start to become aware of um what's going on and it just started to connect to some of that earlier research it just was like a natural progression mm -hmm. um to the other work that I had been doing. It was the same questions, but there was this new evidence, you know, or this m new urgency. I think it was there long before I was doing the work. Um, it was just this like new urgency. I remember having this moment too, where I had in college met these filmmakers traveling from Europe at a bar and they, um, they were like, we're here making a movie about the climate. <laughs> and I was like oh cool like I didn't really realize I didn't and I remembered like um a few years later being like oh shit <laughs> they're making they're making this movie and um I don't know it just be it just started to sync up with the other questions that I was already asking I think <laughs> definitely yeah um so I know when you did the show at Esther Klein Gallery it was focused on the environment and how humans sort of alter and interact with it and then you featured an artist in that show, David Kessler, who you later went on to curate or co-curate um, an exhibition focusing on the deforestation in the Pine Barrens. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think the show, the, the group of artists that were, came to, that were put together weren't all thinking about deforestation. It was, um, it was just, the Pine Barrens was like the site. So some works were maybe just a way to activate the space. Maybe they weren't thinking about the Pine Barrens at all. Mm -hmm. um, um, it was just that their work um, in combination would create this like new relationship. And then there was other people like Steve Hardy, who um, he's Lenape and grew up in the Pine Barrens. And you know his work was like really rooted in the Pine Barrens. So there was a lot. I was myself really excited to read um, John McPhee's book, The Pine Barrens, and learn more about that history. And I became really interested in the deforestation. Like, I remember um, getting my first tour. Um, and um, why am I forgetting his name? I want, it's Lord, it's not Lord Wimsey anymore. Um, Alan Crawford, yeah. formerly Lord Whimsy, um, <laughs> told me that it used to look like the surface of the moon. Like after the um, iron and gas, glass industries took all the trees for fuel, it was just this like vacant landscape and all the stumps of the trees were like these craters. Wow. Um, and I, that image really stuck with me. And um, I ended up making a work called Who Owns the Moon? That was about that. Um, I have like remnants of it. It was like, but again, it's like not the same without it. They're like these oh, wow. glass moonshine jars I made. And they ha I use it's this technique where you shove a piece of steel and it makes this, these threads inside. It's called witch glass. It's really hard. I can see that it's really hard to see oh, crazy. what's going on. Anyway. Um, so the moon is like a subject in a lot of your work, I feel like. Yeah. You have like a fascination with the it's moon. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's like a rock or something. Like artists, I, as an artist, I think I just gravitate towards it, and I think it's like um, it, it can act like in the case of that piece where it can be kind of a surrogate for the Earth. Where I was thinking about how people were making these claims to the moon, 
-hmm. in the way that as humans we make claims to the land or the ocean um, and it it um, can have like almost like a, um, a romantic feel it can like um, portray itself as something else when really it's just as cruel as what we're doing here and I mean I think I think the moon it, it, it um, can pretend to be a blank canvas when it really is like wrought with a lot of the same politics yeah that's here. very true so I think it's again like I don't uh, it's like what's behind it or something mm -hmm. Um, I just have a previous question. Going back to your other glow in the dark piece, um, Margarita is asking, she's curious about the dark material in the glass. Is it powder or liquid? Can it be added to ceramic clear glaze? Because she has a student working, experimenting with this. Yeah, um, actually, um, there's this company called Glow Ink, and they make a powder you'll have to see I the one thing about ceramics is that I'm always shocked at that I think there's this misconception that glass is hotter but ceramics is often hotter um, so I'm not sure the temperature um, but it goes pretty high and I yeah you can totally mix it um, that's that's what I was just doing I just mix mine with Elmer's glue and water as oh, wow. a binder so I'm sure it'd be fine in a, gla a clear glaze um, and as long as it can withstand the temperature and maybe it, it will be okay even beyond, um, yeah, it would be totally worth doing an experiment. Can, can I respond? I just, yeah. thank you. I had somebody, in, uh, it was like a year and a half or two, a couple of years ago, but uh, adding maybe a powder or liquid, I can't remember to the clear glaze, but it made it really runny and then it like ran over everything, but um, it was a great idea. And I can see that you, you're doing it in your, your cast glass. Um, she was just glazing some forms, but anyway, it didn't, it didn't seem to work, but I think it just takes testing like everything. Um, something else that might be interesting to them is that a lot of my students will do these tests in class where we'll take um, unglazed ceramics or we'll take found ceramics and sandblast them. Yeah. And then fire the glass, gl the glass in a binder onto it. Nice. Um, nice. And so it's different. It's not like as clean or, you know, I don't know that you'd be able to drink, eat off of it, but I think it could be really interesting. Um, That's cool. It was for an installation piece to be hung out in the woods, actually. But sandblasting it would help give it a good bite so it could, the next layer would adhere to it nicely. That's cool. Thank you. Cool. I love tech talk. <laughs> so yeah. where is your studio? You said Strawberry Mansion. Strawberry Mansion. I'm in here with um, a few other people. Lucia Garzon is next door. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Samantha Mitchell and Aubrey Liebenthal are upstairs. A couple people that you might know. Um, it's a small building, so there's not a ton of people. But yeah, I feel like I'm slowly breaking up with it. Like I haven't been coming. <laughs> I've been neglecting it, and I'm like working on trying to have a home studio. But um, I mean, I, I feel, feel like, like that always happens when you have a kid. So, how has your practice changed now that you're a mother? I mean, I don't really have any time because of COVID. So um, mm -hmm. it's dramatic. It's like, I, I just, I'm just, um, I'm just have to be decided that I'm okay with it. You know, Definitely. I don't really have a choice. So um, the only thing I've been doing is I make these like herbarium sheets. So oh, um, wow. what is that? when she goes to sleep, I take this paper that I've made in the past. It's called, mm -hmm. um, I make it like marbling. Let me see if I can. Um, but instead of like, I use a torch, a, an acetylene torch on water and it creates like a, a straight carbon and then lift it off and it makes these like beautiful carbon, it's, it's disgusting. It's a, I shouldn't do it, but, um, That's awesome. but I've been just, the one thing I can do is I'm outside with this kid every day. So I, I collect. So what, what and, kind of a torch you shine it on? Um, acetylene, if you uh -huh. burn acetylene without oxygen, which like maybe you would weld or something with that, it just creates mm -hmm. a carbon. It also, the reason that I know I was aware of it was because in glass, we'll use it to carbonize like a sand mold. 
oh, okay. and acts as a release. So, but um, I was like, oh, I want to just draw with this, like right on the water and see what happens. Um, and then after, and I have tons of it. So I just, I was using it as like wallpaper. I have like all these rolls of it over here. Um, oh, okay. So I've just been taking some of it home with me, using it as like a backdrop and um, giving myself a little project. <laughs> yeah. So I'm really impressed by like all the different techniques that you do. How do you like, how did, how did you get all of these skills? Like, do you teach yourself all of these different things? I know you went to school for glass, but you make work in so many different mediums. Um, I mean, I think I don't, I don't, I know not all glass artists are like this, but a lot of them are. I think that because you're, you're, le you're learning so much about how the equipment you're using works. And there's um, a lot of methods that we use that um, start like from scratch and like mold making or experimenting, like how me and Margarita were saying, oh, maybe if you try this, there's so much of the, uh, so much unknown that I think it's like a primer for getting interested in other things. But also it's not like, it, it was like, I was seeking that out too as a teenager. So there is something in me that was curious about that and wanting to take things apart. Like something that I like haven't finished is I've been meaning to wire together all these calculators for a piece and using so I can use the solar power to power oh, cool. that power a piece um and I'll just look that up online and there was like these threads of people asking and someone's like you would need like 300 calculators no one would want to do that and I was like <laughs> I want to do that that's exactly what I want of course <laughs> so, like no one would do that so, so I'm mean, sourcing these calculators from well, because I thought that they should be the same, I just, I, I bought them online to start because um, to do a test, I have five, mm -hmm. which will probably only power a very small like light if I'm lucky. Um, and before I, I've never like tried to um, solder my own solar, miniature solar panels before. So I figured I'd start like eliminating variables before I like, I would love to have them not be the same and just be ones that I have in my drawer or find at the thrift store. So for mm -hmm. now, I just bought them online. Yeah. This kind of reminds me of a piece you had at Little Berlin and I can't picture what it looks like right now in my head. But I just okay. remember you had a bunch of little computer fans. Yeah, I have, yeah. I have them still. <laughs> How many computer even? fans did you have going like, at like, like 200. <laughs> I still have them if you need a fan. I used them in that piece that you used on the invitation. It doesn't have the plant in it, but. Oh it, yeah. It was like this um, air filter that I made. I thought that was so funny that they were selling an air filter that was a plant and it basically just, <laughs> you put a plant and it was actually based on like a, an actual thing that you could buy for your house. Oh, wow. So I thought that was really funny. Um, yeah so that That's was inspired funny. by that yeah so how do you how do you connect with nature in your personal life oh <laughs> um i don't have like any like i'm not like some extreme hiker or anything like that um but i do like to get outside every day i mean i think that's one been one benefit of the quarantine definitely um, is that I've been just like, I haven't, I almost forget how to parallel park. I don't drive. <laughs> um, I just walk and ride a bike and um, go outside all the time. Um, I do really like the ocean. I do too. That's my favorite outdoors thing is like surfing. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's been, um, it's been okay to do that a little bit. Um, it's a little scary in the pandemic, but um, there, I think there's scarier things. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so I've heard this story before, but can you talk a little bit about how you decided to team up with Martha Savory and found the collective Little Berlin? Yeah, I mean, so we met um, and through through a drawing class, then became connected through glass, and then we, we Was were this like in college or high school? High school. Okay. Wow. So you guys and go then, way back. Yeah, we go way back. And then we disconnected. And then I went to Tyler and Martha was going to Tyler for glass. And I had, I, we had just not been in touch. And then um, after school, we 
kind of were around, but not, you know, we hadn't seen each other. And then um, I needed a studio and Martha had this studio in this big warehouse and uh, adjacent to this apartment she was living in, which was the Burke's warehouse. Um, I'm not sure who owns that anymore. It's been so long, but um, it was 119 West Montgomery Street. And we, um, t we just decided we would ha wanted to have like shows and we wanted to build a community. And uh, I think it was really a, 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 because from that feeling that I think is not uncommon to feel isolated out of school um, and want to be surrounded by other thinkers and makers. And something that we really wanted to do was I mean, I remember our open call was like, we called for like uh, longshoremen. We were like anybody who could see a use for this space. Um, um, and like looking back, I realized that um, anytime you paint a wall, walls white and then um, have art shows that run every month, mm -hmm. it's gonna be really challenging for people to see outside of that and see that it could be other things. But originally we were hoping that people would just see it as this, this other space. Okay. Yeah. Um, Did you also kind of feel like you wanted to create a space like that because you, you know, there you didn't have access to like commercial galleries or something and you wanted to kind of have a new place to show work or was that factored in at all? Um, I think that the one thing that we did do was say that we wouldn't want to be, um, what's the right word? Uh, we didn't want to necessarily always be showing our own work that it was important to us that it would be curatorial that we would be creating space for other people. Um, and I think that that has benefits outside beyond showing your own work. I mean, I've never been really good at being an advocate for myself. It's always easier to be an advocate for other people. Um, I mean, here I am talking about myself, but <laughs> that's um, generally um, it took me a long time to get here, I think. Um, that, was our, that was our motivation. We looked at other models like 1026 and Vox Populi, and we felt mm -hmm. like those felt like closed communities, like you couldn't access, it felt harder to access. It might've just, it was probably just in our mind of perception, a matter of perception, but we were thinking we wanted to create a space where people felt like if they had something to contribute that they had a space. It was yeah. maybe a little bit too democratic. Um, well, that's kind of how I felt like it was honestly. And I think it's good, you know, there are benefits to curating other people's work and not curating your own work because obviously you're biased in many ways towards yourself. So it's, you know, it's a way to kind of feature a bunch of other people, which is amazing. And I do want to mention that you said that it, it was just used primarily primarily as an art gallery, but I remember there was a dojo in the back. That's true, there was a dojo. <laughs> That's true. If you turn the corner, there was like swords and stuff. So. Yeah, that's true. There was a dojo. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, and I think that um, looking back, that, that idea that you can't carry it yourself into a show, I, don't, I, I think I don't believe in that anymore because mm -hmm. that's kind of like um, a more elitist, like museum maybe not museum. I don't know whose idea. I don't know whose idea it was. Sometimes I look back and I think we adopted too much of the calendar, too much of the precedent of like what we thought was the authority of art because, and it was kind of fun to like perform it, but um, um, like if I did it again, knowing what I know now, I would maybe do things differently. A different thing, yeah. Um, but that was so long ago. That was like 14 years ago. So yeah. you've come a long way since then. And then you came on to be a member of Vox Populi for a while. Like, what are some of the differences in the two organizations? Um, I don't know. I never really figured out how to navigate Vox for myself. I don't know. I, and and that was, that's really just a fault of my own. I just, um, maybe it was the timing. I just, um, um, I, I look at it now and I, I think it's become transformed into such an amazing organization. I love the people there. Mm -hmm. I love what's happening. Um, I just, when I was there, I just couldn't, I just couldn't find my footing or something. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Well, you had some amazing shows there, I will say. Thank you. <laughs> it was good for me for that because I think I didn't have like a strong, um, I, I didn't show my work. I, I didn't know. I remember my first show, I freaked out. I was like, I can't do this. <laughs> and I didn't do it. I, I did. I had someone else show their work. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Well, I'd love to see some of these pulverized balls that you make. Okay, I have pulverized balls. Okay. 
Here's some of them. Does anyone have any questions for Kristen? You see, it's checking in. Too dark. They're really boring. I mean, I think they're more fun in person because they have like kind of like I think they have like a charm to them. So what is this one made out of? I don't usually. The idea is that I don't tell people, but I'll tell you because it's like a intimate. <laughs> thing. But this is like a glove. Okay. A leather glove. And obviously that uh, didn't go through the the big machine at the recycling center. So no, how? The reason I was just making them by hand. Oh, okay. This is a seashell. And I would just, you know, like a snowball. Um, this is like the New York Times with. Um, <laughs> That's really interesting. Who was that Mexican drug lord that got arrested and he was found digging a hole under? Oh, El Chapo. Yeah, uh, he was on the cover. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and this is like a picture frame with the picture and the glass and everything um, oh. in it. So. So anyway, the idea for me is just to kind of um, resist this, um, like this Western tendency to um, privilege objects. Yeah. Um, so to make them, I mean, of course they're their own category. Now we can start to put them into size or color, or shape or guess what they are, but um, to maybe not allow them to be uh, fetishized in like um, a standard or expected way. Yeah, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I have a question for Micah. It says, drawing seems to be very central to your practice, even when it's not obvious in your work. Do you draw a lot and enjoy it? I don't draw a lot. <laughs> um, I think I would, but I, I think it's like a, it's like a, a time thing. And I think, um, I think of glass making as drawing a lot. Like, uh, a lot of things that I start with, I'll, um, I'll start by making them in the glass and realize like, no, 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 I just, it needs to be something completely different. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe that's because I feel comfortable in that material or something. You don't make sketches, you just like go for it with the glass. I do draw a lot. I draw like an exhibition form layout a million times. Like mm -hmm. I love to imagine um, how things will exist in a room and connect with each other and um, I mean, that's what I always feel like I isn't here in this room. Like I wish I could, I mean, I guess I could do that every time I have a studio visit, like rearrange everything in an exciting way. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think I would do it if there was more time. I think that what I do in place of like sketching is like tinkering. Like I'm like, oh, let me like try to solder these solar panels together. <laughs> that will be like my kind of like um, thinking time. Yeah. That makes sense. So do you think when you start a project, you kind of like tinker and experiment until you come out with something or do you have like an idea planned out ahead of time? Um, I think it always changes a lot because I usually try something I've never done before. Mm -hmm. um, and then I learn about the material or the process and um, decide, you know, as I go that this wasn't, um, yeah, like even I'm, I was working on this um, show for the Schuylkill Center about Earth Day. And so I was like, I'm gonna show you, like, I don't know if you can see these prints. Um, yeah. These prints are from the um, Urban Archives at Temple um, from the first Earth Day in Philadelphia. And then I also was like, so I printed them more traditionally and then I was like transferring them on glass um, and I was also making these, um, sun prints from, like, I was using daisy, uh, not daisies, I was using daffodils and making an ink and then exposing that to the transparencies of the images. So I was trying all these different things, um, and as I'm doing that, I'm thinking about, like, what does it mean to be using shards of glass? What does it mean to be using, like, a Xerox print? What does it mean to be using plant material? And then I like fine tune from there and eject ideas and um, and it sounds insane when I say that out loud, but that's kind of just how I have to do it is like try everything. Yeah. And then fine tune. It's a really adventurous way of working and I love it. <laughs> 
Um, so since you do a lot of these experiments, do you have any like really interesting failed experiments that you want to show us? Oh man, I wish I had <laughs> known that question in advance. I feel like <laughs> I could have shown you something, but I don't, don't really mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> I mean, I have this thing and I'm like, why is this still here? Um, but this was like, um, let me pull it out. This was me. Can you see that? Yeah, it's like a spiral. Yeah, this is me trying to fuse <laughs> the sand into like glass using the laser cutter. <laughs> or not the, yeah, yeah, the, um, yeah, the laser engraver. Oh, so you put sand on a piece of board and tried to turn it into glass with the laser? Right, I was thinking if it was hot enough and oh. if you did enough passes that you could do a drawing. And so at first I tried sand, but sand is like straight quartz, so it's, all, it's a lot hotter. And then I tried like, um, purchase like glass powder. And so I don't even know, it's like, I don't even know where that image came from. It was just like, I needed to try that and just chose that kind of spiral labyrinth design. Did it so work? It didn't work. But I think I also, I remembered thinking like, uh, I've seen people do it now. And I, I have a, I have a strange relationship with those machines. I feel like at first I was really excited about them. I was using them a lot when I first had access to them. Like when Little Berlin first started, I was use, using a lot of a, um, the laser cutter and acrylic. Um, and now I just don't know if I think it's so interesting or necessary. Yeah. Um, um, and sometimes for me, the idea is more important than like technically figuring something out. So I'll just be like, this is a waste of time. Yeah. I could just draw it or I could just print it on my computer printer or something. How do you feel about 3D printing? I took a class. I have some little things I've made. Um, I hated this class, um, but this was like, so the one of the things that I did was create my own 3D printer with the hot glue gun. And like, oh. scan, then I scanned the thing I made and then um, 3D printed it. <laughs> That's what this is. Um, but I thought that it was, I haven't quite figured out why you would do it, use it yet. Um, I love the work and I really, I, I apologize for not remembering the artist's name from the exhibition at ICA where the artist was taking artifacts from the, um, from the Anthropology Museum at Penn and 3D printing them. Does anyone remember that work? Anyway, I thought that that was really, beautiful and exciting and they show I like when it shows the glitches or the um, imperfections of the machine but um, I don't know I don't know if I have the right words right now to tell you why I don't like it <laughs> that's fine um, does anyone have any questions we're coming up on the end of the talk so if you have any questions or comments you can feel free to just ask Kristen That's okay if you don't. I, I just want to say I love the dance with the materials. It's awesome. Um, there was a time when I would make small work and, and I would wait for it to tell me what material it wanted to grow into to be a larger work. And uh, it's really exciting. Materials are amazing. And each one, you know, whatever, all the amazing things, your work is beautiful. Um, and, and, and daring, and that it's really exciting. Um, I'm really glad to get to, to meet you for the first time. Oh, thank and, you so uh, much. Yeah, I, I look forward to meeting you in person and talking more. Now all I want to do is just talk to you, but anyway, thank you for opening your studio. And, uh, and uh, do, you, do you guys not know each other? Never met. Okay, but, Margarita does a lot of work about the climate as well. Climate change, and I, I, I I dance in so many different materials, bronze, glass, so many things, but my, my heart and my life is always seated in ceramic, but in um, my community work and some other times in my life, I've really worked with a lot of materials. Yeah, concrete to bronze to, to glass and stuff. So it's really exciting. Yeah, it's overwhelming. <laughs> talk about materials. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you, I agree. Um, so I feel like you, you reference a lot of like books and literature in your work. Um, 
What are you currently reading? Um, I'm reading The Parable of the Sower by um, Octavia Butler. Okay. What's, what's that about? It's basically, I had to stop reading when the quarantine and the, and the, um, uh, everything that's going on, it was almost too real. I had to take a break. Um, but I'm, I'm almost, I almost finished it now. It's, it's, it's a really good book. It's basically takes place in like 2050 and people, um, have very little, it's a lot more extreme. It's, um, pretty apocalyptic. People don't have access to water and, um, the main character, Lauren, creates a religion called Earthseed. And I think I was talking to you earlier about like being really open to change and like the main tenant is like God is change. Um, so anyway, I would highly recommend it. Hmm. It's the first in a series. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, does anyone else have anything for Kristen before we wrap up? I, I think is, you're going to be so annoyed. Can I ask a question? <laughs> I don't have to. Yeah. Please do. I was just thinking it. about, like, I know that you've been thinking for a while before quarantine about, like, um, well, you talked about it. The, like, when do we need to make things? Sorry, there's, like, PBS kids in the background. Um, <laughs> try to keep that out here. Um, like, when, when do you even need to make objects? Or what, you know, the use of material and sort of taking up space and using things in this moment and in this time on our earth but um now you're in a position where you like don't have time to make objects anyway you don't have the space and i know as a mom it's like hard to even have the mental space to think about things but i just sort of wonder where you are now about thinking like what things could look like now or going forward or next in your work and maybe that's a really crappy unfair big question but um you don't have to answer it i was just sort of curious about in this moment in time like what you're thinking about doing next in relation to those facts um i don't really know because i like i said i think i've been trying to be open to like how i'm being changed by this time and i don't know what that is yet because it's happening but um <laughs> and when i say it and i realize it connects to the book i'm like am i following this religion but um i um i before quarantine and and i like when i was starting to think about those questions this idea of what needs to be made um i was thinking about this idea of model making and like the proposal as like a surrogate for like the real thing because so much of my work is in boxes like it it, it exists so perfectly in a space and i carefully and obsessively think about how it will function as this kind of like dark Disney ride or something like that um, for an audience and then it goes away and I don't sell art and it just disappears. I, if I could give it all away, that's that would be better than it being here in my studio. Um, and so I like this idea of like maybe being able to generate um, new ways of thinking and being in the world by like a model, like a architect. So I was looking at architectural models and um, thinking about artists, artists who use the proposal as like a final form. That's where I'm at. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. We have one last question. Um, who is the person who said what it does? What does it take to create a world that is believable outside of our own? Um, I said that, but um, it was based on um, um, Tolkien, who wrote you know the lord of the rings and things like that and i have this book it's called um tree and leaf and it, it he he goes over what it takes for an artist um to be um to convince you like and that's what he he talks about how you have to convince someone what what it takes to convince someone that the sun is green for example in a story and that it takes a kind of elvish craft um and so it this is um tree and leaf is uh, Tolkien talking about his creative process. All right. Well, I think we have to come to an end now. It was really great to see your studio, Kristen, and thank you so much for joining us tonight, everyone.